Welcome to uh, lecture one. This is the first in a series of lecture that is going to accompany and explain my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in uh, Northwest Indiana, and this is the book. And uh, you can find the book on uh, Amazon. I'll provide the link. Now, chapter one of the book is Disorders of Water Balance, Hyponatremia and Hypernatremia. Each lecture is going to be about 10 to 15 minutes. This is uh, part one. I'm going to emphasize the most important points. I'm not going to be reading from the book. You can do that. Just the important points will be emphasized in these lectures. First definitions, uh, what is hyponatremia? Hyponatremia is low sodium, so we have serum sodium less than 135 milliequivalents per liter or millimole per liter. For sodium, milliequivalents or millimoles are exactly the same. Hypernatremia is sodium above 145 milliequivalents per liter or millimole per liters. It is important to emphasize, and I'm going to repeat that more than once, that both hyponatremia and hypernatremia are disorders of water balance. Never think of these are as disorders of sodium. It's water. Now let's look at these three images. In the middle we have a glass and it has water and it has sodium. Let's consider that a normal situation. Now in the glass in the right hand side we have the hyponatremia situation so we added water so the amount of sodium is the same we added water we diluted the sodium this is where the term dilutional hyponatremia came so think of hyponatremia as extra water in that glass okay now never forget that image it is possible that we can add more sodium and more water and both have increased, but in hyponatremia, the increase in water is more than sodium. This is why we have hyponatremia. 99% of the times, this is the situation, okay? Now, in the glass in the far left, we have hypernatremia. Now, here, the amount of sodium is the same, but we have less water. Imagine that some of that water has evaporated. So the sodium is the same, but we have less water, like you have in dehydration, from nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So, to summarize, hyponatremia, we added water, so it's too much water. Hypernatremia, we have less water. The amount of sodium really did not change. So, hyponatremia and hypernatremia are disorders of water balance. Okay, so now we move on to some other definitions, osmolality and osmolarity. Most of the times these two terms are used interchangeably, but as a general rule, when we talk about serum osmolality, we're talking about the body. So it's the measurement of different solutes that exist in the serum. Um, this is every particle, every ion, sodium, potassium, calcium, protein, uh, glucose, all that contribute to the serum osmolality. In a normal adult, it's between 280 to 295 milliosmoles per kilogram of water. If we're using the system international, the standard units that are used mostly outside of the United States, it's in millimole per kilogram. Now, osmolarity refers to the number of osmoles in a liter of a solution. Usually, this is outside the body. So if we have a liter of normal saline, we say the osmolarity is 308 because it's 154 milliosmol or mole equivalent coming from sodium and the same from chloride. Now, uh, hypoosmolarity, hypoosmolality is less than 285 milliosmol per kilogram of, of water, while significant hyperosmolarity is over 308. 10. Again, the normal range is 280 to 295. Urine osmolality varies a lot between 50 to 1200, depending on intake. Now, serum sodium and osmolality. Serum sodium is the main cation in the extracellular fluid, while inside the cell, 
really potassium runs supreme. So the most important extracellular cation is sodium. Now, sodium is not alone with it. You, you have an anion, either chloride or bicarbonate. So sodium plus the chloride or the bicarbonate contribute the most to serum osmolality. So we said serum osmolality is 280 to 295. If serum sodium is 140 times 2, 280. So it's the major contributor to serum osmolality. Now, the equation you see on the screen is the Edelman equation. It's been there since the 50s, and it says that serum sodium is proportional to exchangeable sodium and exchangeable potassium divided by total body water. Now, you might ask why potassium? Both potassium and sodium are active osmols. So, when you have hypokalemia, sodium will move into the cells. Now, when you replace potassium, that sodium will go out, potassium will go back in. So, potassium is as active when it comes to osmolality as sodium. So, if you have a patient, especially with severe hypokalemia and hyponatremia, and you're placing both, you have to take both into account, otherwise we can make grave errors, and more on that later when, when we do equations and problems. But for now, remember that serum sodium is proportional to exchangeable sodium and exchangeable potassium divided by total body water. What is exchangeable? What's available? So we're not talking about, say, sodium that is in the bones, for example. Now, how do we calculate serum osmolality? Well, we do a basic metabolic panel, basic chemistry profile, we multiply sodium by 2, we divide the glucose by 18, and the blood urea nitrogen by 2.8, and we add them all together. If we're using the SI units, the International Unit System International, then we, we don't need to do any uh, dividing, we just multiply the sodium by 2, we add the glucose and the blood urea and nitrogen all in millimole per liter. Now, what's an osmolar gap? An osmolar gap is due to a substance that we're not measuring, like alcohol, like ethylene glycol, that, like methanol. This is very important in poisoning, and then there is a gap, there is a difference between measured osmolality in the lab and the one we just calculated. So that is significant, especially for suspecting certain uh, poisons. Now, what is tonicity? Tonicity is effective osmolality. So, plasma tonicity is determined by effective osmos. This is sodium, this is glucose, because they don't just freely cross cellular membrane, uh, as opposed to urea and alcohol, which do. So, plasma tonicity is sodium times 2 plus glucose, okay? So, when we're talking about intravenous solutions, we say that normal saline is isotonic to the plasma because it has the same tonicity as the plasma. If we have severe hyponatremia, we're going to use hypertonic saline because it's hypertonic to plasma. So this is an important concept. It's called tonicity. Now, hyponatremia, when we encounter hyponatremia, we measure serum osmolality, and we have three possibilities. Either the serum osmolality is low, and this is the most common situation. It's below 280 milliosmol per kilogram of body water, and this is called hypotonic hyponatremia. Or serum osmolality can be high. So we have low sodium, but with hypertonicity. So serum osmolality is high, or it can be isotonic. Serum osmolality is the same, but the sodium is low. Let's expand on that a little bit. Hypotonic hyponatremia. This is what you're going to see by far. In this situation, sodium is low, serum sodium is low, and serum osmolality is low. Both are low. Why? Because we have excess water. Again, back to that image of the glass, okay? We added water. So that decreased the osmolality and decreased the serum sodium. This is by far the most common situation. But sometimes we have hypertonic hyponatremia. So serum osmolality is more than 295 milliosmol per kilogram of water. And the most important example is hyperglycemia. When, when you have someone uh, with severe hyperglycemia, the glucose 
pulls the water from the cells. Okay, the water shifts from the intracellular space from inside the cell to the extracellular compartment, and that is the cause of the hyponatremia. So the osmolality is high because of the high sugar, because of the hyperglycemia. This is a less common. Now, uh, sometimes um, it, it, it people. Um, what about pseudo-hyponatremia? Pseudo means false, of course. Pseudo-hyponatremia is seen in two situations, severe hyperlipidemia, and it has to be like, severe, like severe hypertriglyceridemia, and severe hyperproteinemia, such as paraproteinemia. And in this situation, because the protein or the lipids, the triglycerides, are high, they're going to occupy a bigger portion of the blood so the plasma water decreases so the total sodium is the same but the proportion of sodium now in in the remaining portion of the plasma water is less and sometimes depending on how we're measuring that uh, we can get hyponatremia but that's false why the osmolality is the same it did not change and the amount of the sodium concentration in plasma water is the same now, here, when, when we measure osmolality, again, it, 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 it's normal. And uh, uh, usually, nowadays, we, we measure sodium uh, with, a method, uh, with, with a method called the ion-specific electrode, ISE, which makes this rare. Um, it, it has to be severe. So for uh, serum triglyceride of 1,000, you decrease serum sodium by 2. So uh, again, it has to be really severe to cause this. Talk about uh, hyperglycemia as pseudo hyponatremia, and and this is not correct. Like we said, with hyperglycemia, you have shift of water from the intracellular space into the plasma, and that causes hyponatremia. It is a true hyponatremia. It's not pseudo hyponatremia. Okay, so hyponatremia associated with severe hyperglycemia is not pseudo hyponatremia. Now we can correct sodium, and so we me we measure sodium, and then uh, we measure glucose, and we use the f the following equation: we add 1.6 times measured glucose minus 100 divided by 100 to measure sodium. So, for example, if blood sugar is 788 milligram per deciliter and serum sodium is 122, corrected sodium will be 788 minus 100 divided by 100. We get um, uh, we, we get the results, we multiply that by 1.6, so we get 11, and then uh, the answer will be 133. Some, some people raise question about the accuracy of this equation. At, at any rate, what, what you need to do, if you have severe hyperglycemia, you should work on that, correct that, and then see what happens to the sodium. Definitely, I would not react and give, say, 3% saline, uh, otherwise we'll end up with the uh, hypernatremia later on. So this is the end of lecture one. Um, in the following lecture, we're going to start talking about the uh, physiology and pathophysiology of hyponatremia.